Good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Harmony this morning. If you're uh, just visiting with us, we want you to sit back and enjoy uh, your time. You're certainly welcome here. We look forward to meeting you after the service. As we begin our service today, we just have a few announcements for you. You get to hear these. All those people that come 10 minutes from now will miss them. And so thank you for being on time. Uh, first of all, we want a special welcome today to uh, our executive minister of our denomination, Leanne Friesen, who is here with us today, and you'll be hearing from Leanne a little later. I get a break today, and uh, Leanne's going to bring this morning's message. We are also going to be um, uh, having a seminar coming up. I think there's a slide, Tom. Um, a seminar coming up. Help me out, Tom. Should be a slide there. On March the 2nd, keep going. Uh, there's a, a seminar. <laughs> Tom hasn't had his coffee yet this morning. Um, yeah, you're not in the announcement slides yet, I don't think. Randy, okay, I'm just going to go. So March the 2nd, there's going to be a, a cultural awareness seminar here. Uh, there are some uh, booklets out there on the table, right? Heather, do you anything yeah. else you want to say about it? Maybe you can. There we go. Anything you want to say about it? Well, you know, in our, in our global world that we live in, we come up against situations where we realize that sometimes we're being offensive or we're not quite communicating what we want to communicate to another person because they're from a different cultural ethnicity or, um, I mean, frankly, even sometimes getting married and you realize, hey, we, we might think we're the same, but we don't see eye to eye. So this, is a, this seminar is to help you to improve your cultural intelligence. And um, it's, it's, we'll be learning things that apply, hopefully here at church, um, that just to be more intentional about the way that we show love and um, communicate, and also to in workplace and things like that. Um, uh, when I got when I did my training, uh, Randy Randy and I we paid three thousand um, dollars. I'm not going to give you the three thousand dollar <laughs> course, but but you'll definitely it's it's really good it's really good material. Very good. And it's Saturday. And it's on a Saturday morning. And it's free, and you need to sign up, just so we know how many people are coming. Yes, and if you sign up, then we'll know how much. Is it muffins? How, how many delicious treats to provide that morning for you? So if you don't sign up, there's nothing to... My, my big takeaway from what you just said, Heather, was there's some couples that get married that actually see eye to eye, which is so weird. I, <laughs> I, I've got to hear more about this anyway, but maybe cultural awareness will help me. <clears throat> uh, no, just uh, encourage you to be there. I think it's, it's something, especially our community has changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly, we want to be good neighbors. We want to be good friends. We want to, as a church, we want to be a welcoming and hospitable place. And it's so important to understand the different backgrounds that people come from. So thank you. Heather will be facilitating that. We look forward to that on March 2nd. So just, just there is a, there's a little survey. Mm -hmm. Well, not little. It's a little bit more than a survey. That you need to have done before you come. So bring your completed surveys, and then we'll go through it. Very good. Thank you. On the next day, on March 3rd, we're going to have a pancake breakfast here before the service starts. And so um, come to church early. Uh, we want you to come. It's 8.30 in the morning. We're going to be having breakfast together. Uh, the youth that are going, youth and young adults that are going to uh, Dominican Republic on the mission trip are going to be preparing that meal for you. And then during the service, you're going to be, they're going to be presented. We're going to be praying for them and sending them off as they uh, are, are going to be leaving us <coughs> to... Uh, go to the Dominican Republic from the 9th to the third, uh, 16th of, of March. And so a great opportunity for you to do that. And if you're newer to Harmony and you have not yet heard our other pastor preach, Pastor Sergio will be preaching that morning. So this is your chance to meet our, our youth pastor uh, that day. And then I uh, also want to mention to you this, to this morning, right after the service, is our annual meeting, part two. And uh, so we would like you to stick around. If you're a member, please stay. If you're not a member, you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, um, there will be coffee on in the gym as well. That meeting shouldn't take too long. I don't anticipate that it'll take very long. But uh, if you stick around for it and just hear what God's been doing in the life of our church, 
Um, I will say this as well. Uh, Leanne, who will be speaking here uh, this morning, uh, will be in the gym right after the service. And uh, she brought some copies of uh, her book that she has recently uh, published. And so you can engage with her. I know you're going to want to talk to her. What I want to say to you that are members, don't worry. She's promised to stick around long enough to meet you after the meeting. And I know she's not going to leave early because I promised I'd take her for lunch. So <laughs> she'll be here, okay? All right. Listen, as we begin our service this morning, um, let's gather our hearts in reverence and praise. For in this sacred, sp sacred space, we find refuge in the arms of our gracious Savior, whose love knows no bounds, and whose grace abounds forever. Let's worship him together. Good morning. If you're comfortable and able, please stand and join us as we sing together.
that you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop. this time we are going to prepare for our tithes and offerings and if you are a guest with us this morning we just ask that you sit back and relax and enjoy the music this is a time for those who call harmony home to have an opportunity to present their tithes and offerings um, sometimes we forget that the offering is not um, an intermission in the service but it is a time to reflect on God's goodness and his faithfulness to us. And so that's what I would um, invite you to do with us this morning is just to reflect on his goodness. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for how good you are to us, how faithful. And this morning, some, um, some of us may give out of abundance. Some of us may give out of faith. But, Father, we ask you to take these gifts, however they are brought to you, and use them to further your kingdom here and around the world. Thank you for these gifts and these givers. In your name, amen. <coughs> Rising sun till kingdom come, your faithful love is unchanging. Those shadows turn and tempest stir, still you, O oh God, are unchanging. Will we? 
I just wanted to mention one thing before we continue with the service. There will be a youth um, choir get together in the youth room afterwards. We are looking at starting a youth choir to possibly sing for Easter Sunday. So if you have been talked to by Patty or anyone like that, <laughs> um, we would love to see you in the youth room after the service. Just before we pray this morning, and, and don't worry, youth and children, we will be dismissing you, but not yet. Uh, we, do have a, we do have a kids' moment for you. Um, but I'm going to lead us in prayer. And uh, uh, before I do, I just want to mention a couple of things. Uh, next, starting next week, we're going to have a, a special pillar of, what we call it the prayer pillar, <laughs> um, of answered prayer here. Uh, we're gonna, this is something a visual that we're going to use. I think we often have prayer requests. We often talk about the things that we're praying about and asking God to do. We don't often talk about how God answers those prayers. We don't celebrate where we've seen God move. And uh, so we want to, rather than having, um, having you bring your prayer requests, what we're going to be inviting you to do uh, from now through Easter, at least, is to bring your answers to prayer and to deposit them in a, a, a clear cylinder that we have at the, at the front here that will, will be a visual um, you know, a visual for us of how God is moving and working among us. And uh, perhaps you've been using this, I, I, we've been passing this out, it's called God Sightings, Seeing God in the Everyday. We've been passing them out the last couple of weeks, there's still some in the foyer if you don't have one, but basically inviting you to, to um, journal where you see God moving, where you see God answering your prayers uh, day after day. And, and perhaps you want to draw on that in, in submitting uh, some of those prayer answers. Uh, so I'll just leave you with that. Um, I want to invite, before I pray, I want to invite Cheryl Allaby, who's our prayer coordinator for the church. I want to invite her to come and share an announcement with you. So Two City was this past weekend. They celebrated 20 years of churches in Hamilton, of which we're part of, um, working together. And um, they have a prayer room that's going to be at Wetworth Baptist Church. It starts basically today at 11 o'clock, and it's going for two weeks. And tonight at 8, at 8 o'clock, every night except Tuesdays, there's special prayer. Um, tonight at 8, um, Alice from Helping Hands is leading um, a, for a prayer for the homeless, and I think she's going to do that by sharing stories and, uh, and then having us pray. So if you're uh, interested or you're bored one night at 8 o'clock, head down to Wentworth Baptist Church, which is at um, 120 Wentworth uh, North, at, right at Cannon. It's usually a little bit of parking in there. And, um, and join in for prayer. So Monday, tomorrow is uh, creative prayer. Wednesday is listening prayer. Thursday is common prayer. Friday is prayer for revival. This goes on for two weeks except for Tuesday nights, because they have some kind of mission going on there. Um, family prayer on Saturday. You can take your kids. There's activities for, for um, children. Teze worship on Sunday, next Sunday. Prayer for creation, prayer, ponder prayer, soaking prayer, blessing prayer. There's something every night for the next two weeks. And if you just want to go down during the day between 7 and 7, I think, Got that right? No, 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. You can just go in there and prayer. They have a prayer room set up um, with lots of sort of things to lead you in prayer. Um, except on Sundays, it's only from 7, 11. We'd be here anyway. 11 till, <laughs> until 7. So I would encourage you to check it out. And um, I think you'll be blessed. Cheryl, and even if I know some of you don't like to drive at night, um, if... Uh, if you'd like to follow the themes, maybe we can have Yolanda put those on our Facebook page, just uh, a daily theme, uh, so you can be reminded to pray, and, and even if you're not present uh, physically uh, with the folks, um, you, you'd still be able to join them in spirit and, and in prayer. Um, at this time, why don't we uh, stop and just pray together? Heavenly Father, we do have so much to thank you for. Uh, we thank you for how um, Orville is still with us, still in hospital, but um, still with us. 
We thank you for your mercy and for the, the extended time that you've been able to give uh, to him and, and to his children. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Eddie Crawford, who uh, yesterday celebrated his 100th birthday. And uh, God, we just thank you for your faithfulness to him. And uh, even though he's um, not able to, to come out in person anymore because of the dementia that he's suffering from, uh, we just thank you that he's, he's still with us and still a testimony of, of your faithfulness. God, we think of our world today, and we think of the other anniversary that was celebrated this week, uh, two years of, of warfare in Ukraine. And God, we continue to pray as we have been for two years for peace for that country. We pray, God, that uh, you'd bring these hostilities to an end, <clears throat> that, that there would be a reconciliation made, and that these... Uh, these parties would um, just find a way to find peace. God, we pray that same prayer for the Middle East and uh, for what's going on there right now. Lord, we, we pray for our Palestinian brothers and sisters, um, fellow Christians who are caught up in this. We pray for all those um, who are, have been impacted on both sides of the conflict. Um, so often it's, it's the helpless and the those with the, the, the weak, the, those without any other kind of protection, mothers and children and, and the elderly that, that bear the, the biggest cost in these kinds of conflicts. And so, God, we think of all those who've lost homes, who've lost sons and daughters and grandparents, and grandchildren. And we ask, God, that you would help them to find a way to, just to find peace and to live in harmony with one another to accept one another, uh, to, to understand cultural differences and different ways of thinking and being. God, we, we can't even begin to understand the, the complicated scenario there. We're not in the middle of it. But God, we know that you are. We know that you love people all around the world of every, every background. And so God, be present there. Be present especially in your church. May your church be a lighthouse, a place of hope and healing in the midst of all this darkness and chaos. God, for our church, we are so grateful to be celebrating another year today, another year of ministry together. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for um, just the, the, the generosity and compassion shown by this church to, uh, to their neighbors and friends. We thank you for, for those that have, have joined us over the past year who've come to call this place home, who've found friendships here and who found a place to belong. God, we just pray that you continue to help us to, to be good neighbors, to be good friends as we, we journey this road together until you come again. God, for those we've lost this year, we, we mourn their passing. We grieve together the loss of, of friends, of, of experience, of maturity, of wisdom among us. God, we just pray that you would raise up those who will take their places those that will come and join in, in being a part of what you're doing in and through this church, in this community, here on, on the mountain of Hamilton. And God, we thank you for Leanne, who is here with us today. We thank you for the privilege and the honor of having her with us. We thank you for her leadership of our denomination. We thank you for the spirit that you've given her. We thank you for the message that you've placed on her heart, a message that each of us needs to hear today. God, we just pray that you would Fill her with um, just a, a sense of, of being free to say what she needs to say today. That you would give her great confidence in the message you've pressed on her heart. And through your Holy Spirit, speak to each one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to invite Leanne to come. Leanne's going to come. And uh, Leanne, for those of you that... that don't know, or for those of you that are watching online and you're not from Hamilton, you perhaps aren't aware that Leanne <clears throat> was a, uh, the pastor of, of Mount Hamilton Baptist Church just down the, down the way here, not too far away from us on Upper Wentworth. And so she, uh, <clears throat> she's been a, a fellow minister here in the city for a long time. I know shares a deep love for this city as I do. And um, beyond that, a deep love for the family of Baptist churches. And uh, when I got the news that, uh, that Leanne had been 
say elevated, to this position, um, my heart was just bursting with joy. Uh, she's the right leader for the right time for our church. She understands our culture. She understands our people. And uh, she understands the topic that she's going to share with you today. And I'm so thankful that she's chosen uh, to come and to spend today with us. Leanne, take it away. Thank you. It's such a joy to be here. How's my mic? Good? So I actually am going to start with the uh, children's moment or the young people's moment. So the form that I'm passing around is uh, if you'd like to sign up for our email lists. And there's three options. There's one for information about what we do with resourcing and support for families. Any age can sign up. One for youth, and one you'll see called ECB, which is our electronic monthly newsletter. So this is a great way to find out what's going on with us. You can also follow us on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok, or threads, all the options. Some of you are like, I'm not even sure of those last couple. It's hard to keep up with them. And so these are ways that you can learn what's happening, uh, resources we have to offer you, ways to pray for other churches and what God's doing among us. You can also just pass the clipboard along. Now, we're going to be talking today about grief and loss and making space for hard things. And I heard that Eldon, now I didn't know this, is a Swifty. Maybe you don't know what this term means. Uh, that he is a fan of the singer, the pop star, Taylor Swift. Is this confirmed? <laughs> now, s some of you may not have heard of Taylor Swift. She's a very famous singer. Some of you are laughing at that idea that we might not have heard of her. If you don't know who she is, ask your grandkids. They will know. We are going to play a little game today, and there's a purpose here. And the task is for you to tell me if the quote I'm reading, and again, I'm just grabbing the answers here, is by Taylor Swift, the singer, or is it from the book of Lamentations in the Bible? So Lamentations is a book of lament and sad expression of loss, written at a time that might feel comparable to many people what's happening today. Great tension in that part of the world and the nation of Israel. And so, here's your guess. So if you have a guess, you can just yell it out. Here's the first one. Is this Taylor Swift or Lamentations? I remember it all. Oh, how well I remember the feeling of hitting the bottom. Who thinks Taylor Swift? Raise your hand. Who thinks Lamentations? Many of you didn't raise your hand. You think I'm kidding. We really are playing this game this morning. Okay, the answer is Lamentations. Keep track of your score. Okay, nice. Okay, here's the next one. Have you ever seen anything like this? Ever seen pain like my pain? Seen what he did to me? Taylor Swift, raise your hand. Tough one. Lamentations, raise your hand. Also, Lamentations. It rains, here's the next one, it rains when you're here and it rains when you're gone. Taylor Swift, raise your hand. Now you're not sure. Lamentations. Oh, that one's T. Swift, that's Taylor there. Okay, okay. Long were the nights when my days once revolved around you. Taylor Swift, raise your hand. Lamentations. It's hard, Taylor Swift. They sound a lot. Walls of insincerity, shifting eyes, and vacancy vanished when I saw your face. Taylor Swift or Lamentations? Taylor Swift? Lamentations. I mean, a hint is to look at the first row, guys. Tip. <laughs> Tip. Okay. That is Taylor Swift. I weep, weep buckets of tears, and not a soul within miles around cares. Who thinks Taylor Swift? Who thinks Lamentations? That one's Lamentations. <laughs> do you have to do this? I was thinking you could be trusted. Hold on, I think I skipped one. I gave up on life altogether. 
I've forgotten what the good life is. Taylor Swift. Lamentations. That one is Lamentations. Okay, let's do two more. Did you have to do this? I was thinking you could be trusted. Taylor Swift. Yep. It was Taylor Swift. I won't make you raise your hand. Let's, let's jump to the very last one, because I love this one. These walls, I'll just read it. These walls that they put up to hold us back will fall down. The time will come for us to finally win, and we'll sing hallelujah. Taylor Swift or Lamentations? Who thinks Taylor Swift? Who thinks Lamentations? Taylor Swift, friends. <laughs> Now, why do I play this little silly game? I think games are fun, for one thing. But sometimes we have this idea as followers of God that everyone who believes has it all together, that we're not supposed to name our sadness or our sorrows. And the book of Lamentations, this entire book, is about saying, I am sad and I grieve and my heart is heavy. And it's so timeless that sometimes we can't even tell it apart from one of our modern-day pop singers. But yet God is woven through it. And so to all of our kids today, but not just the kids and young people, I hope you'll know in your times when you are sad or when you're struggling or you feel like yelling at God, everything is awful, that that's okay and it's normal. And people 3,000 years ago did it too, and God was with them in their sadness. I hope we can remember that. And I, so I dismiss the kids now, right? So if our kids and teens want to head out, I think you won the game. I saw that your stats were looking good. Thank you. And I'm going to read from the book of Ruth. So I'm not actually preaching from Lamentations. I'm going to share from the book of Ruth, as I said. The Bible is a book of many smaller books. And they all have different genres and different styles. Lamentations is poetry. The book of Ruth is a very tiny book, and I'm going to read from this story now. Um, the story is about a woman named Ruth, but we're going to be looking more at a story of the, her mother-in-law, Naomi. I'll fill this in a bit more when I go. So I'm going to start at chapter 1. I'm going to read a little bit and skip to the end of the chapter. So if you're following along, it's Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech. His wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malin and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. Then I'm going to jump ahead, and it says, so the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. So this is after the death, and Ruth and Naomi are going to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred. Because of them, and the women explained, can, exclaimed, can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. We're going to talk about this more. When my son was born, some of you will know him. He does some, he's been at youth events here and stuff. And I have permission to share this story, which I know is very impressive for a 16-year-old. Um, somehow, we started giving him the name Boo Boo. I know. His name is Josiah, but you probably have this. You know, somehow like this weird name connects. You start calling your baby this little nickname. So for the first three or four years of his life, as a term of endearment, we would call him Boo-Boo. Hey, Boo-Boo, you know. And I remember very vividly when he was about four, maybe five, he looked at us one day when we said this, and he said, Mom and Dad, my name is Josiah. It is not Boo-Boo. I am too big for that name, which is a fair point. <laughs> And uh, he was very clear about that. And it came with sadness for me. 
But we agreed. And there was an understanding behind it. It made sense because really what he was saying is, I'm changed. There's something different in my life now. And that's not the right name for me anymore. And that's very much what happens. I'm going to just move. I'm going to move this over and this. Do this. Here we go. So I got a little bit more room to get my notes. And that's um, very much something that can happen to many of us. Maybe, is this an okay place to stand, screen-wise and stuff? You want me to go more in the middle, Eldon? He's going to move it for me. Ah, oh, yes, you're the best. Now, as I talk about that, thank you. You may have had similar cases in your life or people you know, right? Sometimes there's a time that a name that you had for some reason will change. Most common example is many of you when you got married. You took on a different last name and it reflected a change in your life. You may have taken on a role, a title. Some of us here, Eldon and I, became reverends at one point in our life. You may have become doctor or have a doctorate. You may have come from another country or your parents did. And perhaps when they came to Canada, they took on an English name or a more Canadian name. And all these things reflect life changes. And the part of the story that I just read also has this woman who says, call me by a different name. Did you notice it? Her name was Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. And she asks the people in her life to call her Mara, which means bitter. Now, you've already heard just the beginning part of that story, but and some of you may know it well, but let me give you some background in case. This story takes place again in the book of Ruth, which is sometimes described as being almost like, a, I like this description, as a historical, a Hebrew historical short story. It's tiny, and there's a few books kind of like them in the Bible, like Jonah or Esther, and they tell these short stories that are meant to speak to something important about God's character. It's written at the, about the same time as the book of Judges around that era, um, well, that's when it takes place, um, and it's happening after what we would call the return to the promised land. So God's people had been in slavery for a number of years. They come back to this land God has promised them, and so this is happening after that. We don't know who wrote it down. It would have been passed on orally, but the story starts with this famine, and it says there's a famine in this land, which is ironic because the story takes place in Bethlehem, you probably recognize that town. Maybe some of you do. Um, you recreated Bethlehem here this Christmas, so you're particularly familiar with it. Bethlehem literally means house of bread, and now there's a famine in Bethlehem. And what we read is that this man, Elimelech, and his family, his wife, Naomi, and their sons, they, go, they leave. They go to a place called Moab, in theory, to wait out the famine, right? Uh, this indicates likely some privilege that they had, that they were wealthy enough perhaps to move. Remember when COVID happened and some people were like, I'm going to go to my cottage and wait it out, that kind of vibe. This is sort of what's kind of happening here. While they're there, however, Elimelech dies, which would have been incredibly tragic, as the death of a husband always is. But at the same time, in this extremely, the makeup of this culture, being a widow was, was risky, scary. You, you relied on your sons, your, your husband or your father. And uh, so she, Naomi gets her two sons married. They marry Moabite women. But then her two sons also die. This is so tragic and so sad. And so this is the part of the story we're going to pick up, that Elimelech's died, her two sons have died, and now Naomi decides she's going to go home. She's going to go back to Bethlehem. Now, there's this part here that, of course, the question is what will her daughter-in-laws do because now they've fully become part of her family, and she gives them an option, and Orpah decides to return to her homeland, and Ruth goes with her. And this is, of course, the very famous part of Ruth that she says, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. And most of the book digs into what happens to Ruth when she goes back. But when we get back, Naomi and Mary, Mara walk in, and it says all these people see Naomi, right? And you can imagine this. They probably haven't seen her for a while. It's been, well, at least over a decade. It says it's been 10 years between those two deaths. And they say, can this be Naomi? You know, there's no Facebook updates in these days. And she says, don't call me Naomi. Call me bitter. And so today, I'm going to talk about uh, grief and loss and when we're at places like Naomi. 
And that might seem like a really weird choice when your executive minister from your denominational family comes to speak, but there's a couple reasons I wanted to do that. One is, um, I'm in Hamilton, I know Eldon, I know your church, I know Harmony. You've had a lot of grief. I know there's been a lot of grief here in Harmony, as there often is in churches. And the other confession is that I'm very passionate about this topic. As Elder mentioned, I just wrote a book about it. I have an Instagram page, Ding the Grievers. And I feel strongly that as churches, we need to make more space for grief and loss and lament. So I suggested several sermons to Eldon, and, and when he chose this one, I was especially excited when I, I kind of said, I think this one. Yeah? Would this, how, what do you think of this? And uh, for these reasons. And he said, yes. Because it's important to dig into because there all will be times we're at a place like Naomi. We'll be at our place, our own place of what I call after the terrible. Something terrible has happened. Uh, for Naomi, it's the loss of these three people that she loves. But we'll also have the terrible things that happen in our lives. A common example, of course, being the death of someone that we love. Maybe we lose a job. Maybe we don't get into the school we hope to get into. Maybe we have a fallout with a good friend. Maybe we go through a terrible depression or an adult child moves away. What does this story have to do with us? How are we like Naomi? Well, you'll see three things I want to talk about here that often happen to us after the terrible, as I call it, and how I believe we see God in them. Move the slides up. So one of the things we see that happens to Naomi and, of course, Ruth and Orpah is that after the terrible, we will usually face some sort of crossroads. And it could be a big life decision, right? In Naomi's case, it's, am I going to stay in Moab or am I going to go home? And she chooses to go home. Ruth also makes a choice. Orpah also has that crossroad. And I think this is such an interesting thing. We have so many small and big crossroads after a terrible, right? After dad dies, are we going to help mom stay in the house? Is she going to come live with us? Do we sell the family home? Do we keep it? All those little things that we have to decide. And sometimes we can reassess our whole lives, right? We have something terrible and we go, you know what? I need to go back to school. I, I, I have a wrong path in life. I need to turn my life around. And all of these things make sense to me. But what Naomi does, I find particularly interesting because what she does is go home to her homeland, to a place of safety that's familiar and comfortable, which is a very common longing at Crossroads, right? To somehow return home again. But for Naomi's life, it's deeper than that. It's not just about going back to the family farm or going back to where we grew up. She is returning to the land of God's covenant. When the nation of Israel was what God had given them. And when they went to Moab, there were many that would talk about this being almost a rejection of God's promises. When Naomi and her husband left, they're leaving God's land, and they went to live in what would have been considered Gentile territory which was frowned, as in people of non-Jewish territory, which was frowned upon and looked at, could be looked at as even a betrayal, right? They've said we're leaving God's people. She returns to the land of covenant, to the promises of God. And I think after the terrible thing, this often is something we experience too. Sometimes we will experience uh, quite struggles in our faith. We may struggle to lean on God but we'll often long to return to God's promises. Right? We stray in life, or we go down a different road, or we find ourselves just so busy and caught up in things that we can forget who God is to us. And in those times when we face that terrible thing, it's so normal and reasonable to say, I need to come back to the promises of God. I need to return to that thing that I leaned on in other seasons of my life. And what I want to point out in this story that I think is so powerful is God makes space for that with Naomi. Notice this. When Naomi returns home, they didn't say, hmm, nice see you to come back. Guess things aren't so great in Moab after all, are they? Right? Sometimes that can be tempting. Huh, haven't seen you in church in 30 years. Funny enough, welcome back. Right? They don't do that, and God doesn't do that to us. They say, welcome, you belong here. This is your home. They recognize her. You're Naomi. You're the person we know and love. 
Jesus told a story like this, right? He talked about having this father as a story. He had two sons. One says, give me my inheritance now, and he goes off and he squanders it, and he's in a state of total destitution. He says, I'm going to go back to my father's house. Maybe he'll let me come work for him. This is called the story of the prodigal son. And Jesus says, and as the son's coming, the father runs to greet him, doesn't say you have to work for me. He says, we're going to have a party. We're going to have a feast because my son has come back. And that's what it's like in those terrible moments. If you have felt far from God, you can always return to the promises of God. We can always come back to the covenant that God has called us to. And the people in your life can too. The people for whom you long that, long for that to happen in their life. And my prayer is that those crossroads will ultimately lead us to God. That they will allow us to go back home, just like it does with Naomi. Another thing that Naomi does, and again, we can see that line in her life, is she wants to find a cause for what has happened to her. And we may do this too. And sometimes when we face those terrible things, we can have those moments of wanting to figure out who is to blame. What's done this? If I can figure this out, that will sometimes help. Naomi's line is, she says, the Lord has done this to me. You hear that? So she's like, this is what's happened to me. God has done this. And we do that in all kinds of ways. Sometimes we say God has caused this. Sometimes we say it's the fault of that drunk driver who caused the accident. They, they did it all. That's what I'm mad at. The doctor who missed the diagnosis. The person who flirted with my husband and destroyed my marriage. We say, this, that's it. Let me figure out the reasoning. And sometimes, of course, there are causes. But what I want to point out in this story is that what really did all this to Naomi was a famine and all these other layers. And in fact, knowing the cause or where it's come from won't change what's happened to Naomi. She feels this. She's like, oh, this is God's doing. But there's actually no evidence of that in the story, although some people try to do that. Some people do go back to that place of blame. You'll read some commentaries that talk about that. I mentioned this already. Some will say, right, they left, they went to Moab. God's punished them for their sin because they left. But I think what's so important to remember is that it's never said in Scripture. Like, that is never stated as the reason that this has happened. Um, and it's funny because we have this other book in the Bible called Job, where all these terrible things happen to Job, and he has death and loss. The difference is the story starts in Job by telling us that we know exactly what's happened, that this is God at work, but God makes clear that it's not because Job sinned. Everyone reading it and around it is saying, oh, it's because all his friends are saying, you sinned, you've done this bad thing, it's on you. And we know, oh, no, you're getting that totally wrong. And the story of Job reminds us that we shouldn't and can't always make those inferences and those conclusions. And so as we're in this season where we're like, if I just find the person to blame, if I just figure out what caused it, if I just get there and I make peace with that, then it'll make sense. We can remember that sometimes we won't truly know. And that's part of it too. And God also makes space for that. And then the last one I want to talk about is this reality that, of course, comes up right at the beginning, and that is this change that happens after the terrible. Naomi says it clearly. She says, I'm not Naomi anymore. I'm bitter. I'm not pleasant. I'm bitter. It's interesting that when I talk to people who are grieving especially, how often they'll say, I feel like part of me died too. I'm not the same person. And we can struggle with our sense of identity. Am I still a wife? Am I still a mother? Am I still an aunt, a friend without that person in my life? And we get changed by these terrible things and all the different things that that can look like. And some people really villainize Naomi for saying this. And this has become one of the reasons I love talking about this passage. So a couple of years ago, I was speaking about this passage about Naomi, and I did a Google search. I don't always do this, and I was just curious because I read a couple commentaries that kind of leaned into this idea, and I was like, how pervasive is this? And it was this theme of don't be like Naomi. And so I started Googling sermons, and I found every sermon about Naomi, and there's lots of them online, YouTube, big, uh, often mega churches, had the theme of don't be Naomi. Naomi was bitter, and don't be her. Now, we could get into all kinds of things about what that Hebrew word bitter means, and we translate our modern version of a bitter woman. We put it on Naomi. We put it here. 
not an equal comparison. But they take this and they go, Naomi says she's bitter and don't be like her. I actually found one sermon and this guy is preaching and he says, don't be like Naomi. And he goes, you know, Naomi only had two children die. Job had way more and he said, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I went, oh, stop. And then I shot my screen. I found this. I, I was like, what an offensive, terrible thing, because this was all I could think of, because it was this huge church. And I thought, in that church, how many grieving women are in that congregation? And men, too. And they're hearing this man say, no, <laughs> there's no space for your sadness, and there's no space for your bitterness, or for you to name how hard this is. Don't be like that. And why that bothers me is that the text never says it. There is no judgment on Naomi in this text. There's no part that says, and Naomi shouldn't have said that. I picture women, Naomi coming in and saying, don't call me Mary, call me bitter, and all the women saying, oh, honey, what happened? Right? Come, what do you mean? What do you mean you're not here? And love her. And we know that this isn't some mark against Naomi, because as we continue to read in the book of Ruth, it's a story of not just Ruth, but Naomi's redemption. That God works powerfully in this. That God never says, Naomi blew it, says she was bitter, can't do anything else in her life. Now, the one thing I would push back on Naomi here, though, is I think it's so meaningful that she says, call me bitter. And I want to assure you that God makes space for you to say, I am changed after my terrible thing, and I am sad. Just like that book of Lamentations. Just like so many of the Psalms that say, I'm angry and I'm hurt and I'm struggling and I'm different. And in the church, we can make space for that, for the Naomi. The thing that I would say is this idea that she seemed to have that she could only be one or the other. She could only be Naomi, that was pleasant, meant pleasant, or bitter. Now, here's the thing that some people do find a bit interesting about me. I go by my middle name. My first name is Gina. People always have questions about this. I always went by Leanne. <laughs> My mother thought it sounded better. You can decide, Gina Leanne or Leanne Gina. Anyway, she called me Gina Leanne, always was named Leanne. But it means lots of my official things are in, G are in Gina. So my husband loves to tell the story. My maiden name is Reed. So he loves to tell the story about a week after we're married, maybe a couple weeks, we went to Blockbuster. That's how long I've been married. So he goes to Blockbuster and uh, for any of you young people here, that's like a place where you go rent movies and you had to bring them home and then put them in a VCR. We didn't even have a DVD player. And uh, he says, oh, it's under Leanne Friesen. And the person says, oh, there's no Leanne Friesen here. And he says, oh, check Leanne Reed, right? Because maybe my name hadn't been updated. He goes, oh, yeah, there's no Leanne Reed. He goes, check Gina Reed. And he goes, yeah, there's a Gina Reed. He goes, yeah, that's her. That's my wife. And, uh, and, uh, and also the guy goes, do you know your wife's name? So picture that moment, right? He's like, Leanne Friesen, no. Oh, yes, Gina Reed. Those are very different names. And they were both me, right? They were both absolutely me. And he had to explain it all. And in the same way that Ruth's uh, Naomi is like, now I'm bitter, she was still Naomi. She was still the mother of these beautiful boys, the wife of this man, and she was bitter too. And both can be true. I hope this encourages you today in your spaces of grief and lament and sadness. But this is where my executive minister hat comes on. And so what that role is, um, is I help oversee all these churches, help oversee staff. Um, some people joke, oh, this is like the Baptist Pope. Not quite because we're a bottom-up organization instead of a top-down organization. Um, but that might be a title that you might uh, hear jokingly said. When we look at this story and what I think about it in terms of our churches, the reality is that in the world, I'm going big here, right? As we look around at the state of society, we might feel like as churches, we are living after the terrible or we're living after a time of great change, which is true, right? We had COVID and there's been a massive societal shift in the role of the church, and you have seen it if you spent any time in church. Almost every time I go visit a church, I ask if anyone knows what the fastest growing religious designation is in Canada. 
No one has gotten it right. I'm going to see how you do. Do any of you know what the fastest growing religious designation in Canada is? She got it right. Most people say Muslim. It's none. So I'd like you guys to say you're the first church that someone got it. First one. Well done. But it's not actually great news. So in the Canada census status, you can pick any number of religions. Islam has grown by about 2%. So this is a narrative we tell that's really interesting. However, between the census data of 2011 and 2021, the fastest growing designation was no religion. 20 years ago, there was about 12% of people who said there were no religion. 34% of Canadians now say they are no religion. That's the fact, and it, that's about an 11% increase from 10 years ago. That's the reality of the religious landscape in which we are now existing. The term we use for that number are nuns and duns, people who maybe were part of the church and they've left, or they've never had any religion. There's a growing cynicism about faith, and we can see this. When you now say to people, and you know this, to your grandkids, your kids, you should come to church. That should go to church. It doesn't exist anymore. And most of our 300 churches in CBOQ are very small. That's the norm. A church of 50 or so would be about our average. After COVID, many of our churches are struggling. Many are trying to make finances meet, and they're asking, what do we do now? Our congregations are aging oftentimes. We're struggling to see new people. We're struggling to find our mission. And we, too, are at a crossroads. We need to help. We need to keep, as God's churches, returning to God and trust God for the next phase. And so we need to embrace that this is a time of crossroads. Whether or not we call this before the terrible, we're at a time where we say, so God's what's next for us? And I pray that, like Naomi, we will lean into God's covenant. We will return home, so to speak. We will stay leaning on God. We don't need to seek blame. That's a common thing to do. It's okay to kind of understand dig what's happening. You know, it's not the government's fault. It's not young people who don't care about the church's fault. It's not any number of these things' fault. It just is what it is. And we need to make space for our sadness and lament as churches and say, yeah, this is tough. We're not the same, and we won't go back to the way things were. But the things that made us, the things that we love about our history are still true, as is what will be in the future. We are still God's church, and we're still the people of God. And so this is what we hold on to as CBOQ to help you understand that. What we're seeking to help you do as a family of churches is connect and convene you with other Baptist churches that can support you. As staff, as a, a body, we help provide resources, training. We do things like financial help, like we help with mortgages. Uh, we help with things like um, uh, accreditation for your pastors, things that help you do the mission you're called to, and also step into new expressions that we want to be supporting. And all that happens through your giving. And I want to say a huge thank you today to Harmony Baptist Church in a very special way. Um, I actually reached out intentionally to you, not just because I live in Hamilton and it's super convenient to come here on a Saturday morning. <laughs> you are one of our biggest givers to CBOQ out of all our 300 churches. I hope you're really proud of that. I hope no one goes, why are we giving so much money to CBOQ? <laughs> um, I, was, I read that and my heart soared because I know how big Ham Harmony is. And I thought, isn't that beautiful? And isn't that amazing? And it makes a difference. We gave out over $400,000 in grants. Most of the money that go to CBOQ goes out into our churches and our ministries. So we gave $400,000 in grants that were all to missional initiatives and in churches this year. We've been able to support new church initiatives, new church plants, and come alongside churches that need it. And isn't that the family of God? that those of us who can offer can help those who have less, and that's being a family. So thank you for that. And what I want to say is that whether or not you gave anything, we are still so glad you are part of CBOQ. And we want to be part of that journey as we can move forward as God's people, perhaps lamenting things that are hard, coming out of crossroads, but trusting that God has something new for us. And this is where Naomi's story is so good, or as we'd say, the story of Ruth. And some of you, again, will know the ending. But what happens is they get back to their 
homeland, and Ruth uh, connects to a man who decides to marry her. And this is such a significant story because, of course, this now provides provision for her. She's safe, she's looked after, and they're woven back in, so to speak, into this story. But what's so interesting is if you go to the very last chapter, chapter 4, the second heading says, Naomi gains a son. Naomi gains a son. Let me read it to you. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better than you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. Isn't that beautiful? The story ends with Naomi's redemption. God is at work in our churches too, and here's the really good part. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And if some of you know the Bible story, and then from David is descended Jesus, our Messiah, is of the line of David. Ruth and Naomi become woven in this incredible, magnificent story of God from which we will all receive grace. That's how God works with a woman who says, I'm bitter. Let me pray for us as we lean in to God's promises. And so, Lord, I thank you and praise you that you are never done with us, that there is space for our grief, our loss, our struggles, and our sorrows, and there's space for our redemption too. And I pray for each person in this church as we seek to experience you in the midst of whatever grief or terrible thing we may be carrying. And we pray for CBOQ asking that as we are at a season of crossroads like all churches these days, that you would lead us as we lean into your covenant and promises. And Lord, I pray a blessing over Harmony Baptist Church. This church has been so faithful for so many years. I pray for their youth ministry, their wonderful summer camps, their incredible Christmas ministry, their amazing work to seniors and the community that they build, for their ministry of prayer, for their support of so many who need it. Lord, we ask that you would continue to fill them with all that they need as they serve you faithfully in this neighborhood, in this place, in this city. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and join us as we sing in response this morning. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my Christ in me. 
here this morning or you've been watching online and, and, uh, and you'd like to talk more about what you heard. If you're grieving, if you're bitter, or if life is just going dandy and you want to talk about that, uh, we'd love to talk with you. You can reach out. There's a, a link on, our, on, our, uh, on the description of this video if you're watching online. Those of you that are here, love to talk to you about what you're going through. Leanne, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it really was an honor to have you here. And, you know, sometimes people ask me, uh, how can you save, how can you serve in a denomination that ordains women as, as preachers? This is why, right here. <laughs> this is why. Thank you. Um, just before I dismiss you, just one last reminder. We're about to have our annual meeting. Uh, those of you participating in that are welcome to stay in the room. Those of you that won't be participating, uh, coffee is on, and uh, Leanne will be in the other room to greet you. So you can spend some time praying to her for that message and thinking of us. I, I know you brought a few copies of your book, and uh, we'll be in to join you in just a few minutes. But with that being said, um, as the people of God who have heard this message, know that there's a place for you within God's arms, and there's a place for you within his church to go with confidence and hope and share that grace and peace with those that you meet this week.